Let's all say this together, the word legacy. Isn't it a big deal? Legacy being a generation that follows us, that carries faith in their heart, love towards God, that long after we're gone, off the planet, I promise, I promise you someday you're going to be off the planet, <laughs> right? But that living past us and beyond us are future generations who love God and serve God and live in the purposes of God. For that we labor. I'm grateful for everything God does among us now, and at the same time, we are always believing for what's coming. I am grateful for children and grandchildren being born and all these things that are going on because God is giving us a future where everything we're living for now is going to live in them, and God's purposes are going to go on for many, many years. And it starts from the very beginning. And so we're going to do some things right here that are very much focused on legacy. And so this is going to be the portion of the meeting where we meet babies. How many of you know that babies are a good thing, right? We're grateful for babies. And so uh, a daughter and a granddaughter has been born to the Bacchuses. And could we bring her up here and just look at her for a moment? Here we go. We're just going to have some introductions to our newest members. We grow the church through people coming to Christ. And apparently we grow the church through people being born. And so there has been so many babies born in the last year. I've been kind of amazed. I've been in ministry a long time. And I don't think there's ever been a year where I saw so many babies born in a church. Yeah, go ahead and come up here. It's okay. So tell us who we have here. So we have Ellie Leia Rodriguez. She's about to be three months in a week or so. I don't think Tracy's here, but Tracy warned me. She told me, and I didn't believe her. Well, I believed her. I just didn't know. She said, just wait until that baby's born and you become a grandma. She's just going to capture your whole heart. And so it's true. <laughs> She's stolen it completely. Huh? So this is Allie, and she's just blessed our family and our lives, and we're so thankful for her. And I love being a Gigi. I'm not a grandma. Hey, my baby. It's awesome being a grandpa. Um, I don't know if it's going to be grandpa or pop pop or whatever. Whatever she figures out is what she'll call me. I'll be happy with that. You know, one thing I know we're doing baby dedications and all that stuff later today, but one of the first things I did with my kids when they were born was give them right to God. Right there in the room that they were born in, I dedicated all my kids to the Lord and gave them back. The first time I laid hands on her, that was the first thing I did. Is I sat there and I prayed over her and I said, Lord, thank you for who she is, but I'm giving her right back to you. And asked him for all the things that he would have for her. So we're just looking forward to see what he's going to do in her life and the life of our family and all of us. And so we just stand here in amazement and awe and in love for her, her mom, for our family. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise God. All right. Well, we'll have a dedication later, but right now we're just introducing the babies. Be a Lion King oh, with the Lion King moment. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. All right. You know what? This is the Lion King moment. Don't you love that? Yes, there she is. <laughs> it's awesome. Is, uh, is Julian, where are you guys? Oh, come on. Come on up here. You must be a proud grandfather today. So who do we have here? Why don't you, why don't you tell us who we have? It's Bo Jude Rivera. He is four weeks this week. Fresh little guy. Very sweet, up all night, <laughs> but it's good, it's good, very thankful to have him. Everything feels right after the, you know, getting married and everything, first few steps, and then this guy popped up, so <laughs> feels good. <laughs> it's good to have gotten that married part in there. That yeah, was yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, we're grateful. Yeah. You want to have the Lion King moment, too? Yeah. Let's, let's just do it. Okay. Lion King moment. Here we go. Look at this little guy right here. Oh, my goodness. Oh, he's brand new. Look at that. All right, you guys. 
you know, with, a, with these beautiful parents like that, you know these children are going to be beautiful children, right? It's like, oh, my gosh. All right. Well, we're going to have baby dedications for them down the road when they can get all the rest of their family members here. But it's great to meet people that are being born into the earth. We just had a grandson born yesterday, Andrew and I did, and I can't wait to meet him. And I want to actually meet this person I've been waiting for for nine months, right? So it is great to meet these babies. I, I love it. You say, well, what are they going to be like? I don't know, but we can see it in there somehow. It's coming. But right now we're going to dedicate the West baby. Come on up here. This is Emiliana, right? Yes. You know, when, when a lot of babies are born, that's a lot of names, man. I was, oh, my gosh. I think we're, like, heading towards 15 babies or something. It's been wild in the last years. How many of you realize that's a great sign? That's life coming forth. A year and a half or so? All right. Well, look at that beautiful red hair. My goodness. Is, is, are there any other family members that would like to be a part of this dedication, by the way, with Emily and Gary? Come back up here. It's, you should have just stayed up here. It's all right. Come on. Anyone else that came today for this? All right. Well, tell us who you have. This is Ameliana B. West. Um, I would also like to invite Jason and Alejandra up here. Um, we just love this family. and um, I was telling you, what am I going to say when I get up there? Um, can you hear me better? Um, I just love that I get to stand up here. Not only do I get to see how much our congregation has just grown. Wow, there's so many of you. Um, but I love that I get to stand up here because it means that I'm part of a body that is going to just support us, pray with us, pray for our children. And I get to stand up here and just proclaim in front of you guys um, for from him are all things and to him are all things especially with this little one and I thank God every day that she's here good morning um, also thinking about what I want to talk about while up here I just was comparing Jonah and Emiliana and how they came into the world and with Jonah we knew very early on what his name would be and for her I think it took us 39 weeks to figure out what her name would be and Still in the hospital thinking about it, like, I don't know. Undecided. Um, and so, and with Jonah, we had all sorts of complications when he was coming to the world, and she was the most boring birth in the world, which is awesome. That's what you want when a baby's born is boring births. Um, and so she is uh, six months now, and, you know, we prayed for her a lot, especially with all the fears and the concerns we had after having him. And uh, Emiliana is kind of a play on Emini's name, which is Emini Anna Rivera. Um, and so I really like the name Amelia, snuck that in there. Um, and it means uh, the one whom we prayed for. And um, it's really true. And not that we named her because of that, but looking at it afterwards, it was pretty fitting. Um, but man, we prayed for her for a very long time. And here she came with her red hair, surprising both of us. And uh, she's been an absolute blessing these past six months, and we're very grateful that she's been added to our family. And uh, I just want to add one other thing. Um, I know that as we're praying for her, you guys are praying for her. And this goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyways. As part of the body, we're up here dedicating our children, and you're praying with us. Um, we're praying for you and your children as well. <laughs> he does love her. <laughs> Not jealous at all. <laughs> you need water? Okay, we'll get you water in just a minute. Here. You can stand up. Okay. Father God, we just give you praise in this moment for this new member of our family. And Lord, we just thank you for blessing us with another one and trusting us with another one. And Lord, as we have dedicated our lives to you as her parents before this congregation, we dedicate her as well to your will, to your purposes, to your desires. Lord, that your will would be done in her life and that she'd be able to do your will out in the earth. 
We love you, Holy Father. We give you everything we can muster. Lord, help us to raise her in the way she ought to go and just give us all the wisdom and all the strength and courage we need to set her on the right path that she can choose you. We love you, Holy Father. Heavenly Father, we just, if you guys would extend your hands, we declare purity and holiness over this child, that she would live a life full of righteousness, that she would not be filled with rebelliousness or temptation to fall away from Christ, but that she would live on the straight and narrow path, and that she would run to Christ, and that she would have Christ as her goal forever and always. And Lord, whenever she comes into trouble or she is confused or tempted, that she would run to her father and her mother and ask for help, that they would be her confidants, that they would be her strength until she is able to carry herself in the things of the Lord. And as the body of Christ and as uh, the church and the kingdom, we say that we will do all that we can to ensure the purity and holiness of this child and that in a serious way, Lord, those who would lead little ones astray would be better for a millstone to be tied around their neck and for them to be thrown into the water. And Lord, that you would put a sobriety and a seriousness on our hearts and how we train up our children in the kingdom kids, in our grandchildren, in our friends' kids, in our own children, a sobriety, Lord, that these are eternal things that these moments last forever, they are not to be taken lightly. An acute baby is a cute baby, but they are full of sin. They're born sinful. So, Lord, we will do everything that we can to ensure purity and righteousness in this family over Gary and Emony, that they will stand for Christ and they will live their lives in the way that God has called them to be. And you've given them everything they need for life and godliness, and we dedicate this family to you. In the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for this family and this child. Gary and Emily, God has given a great deal of grace to each of you. There is, there is a potential in your lives that you haven't even touched yet. And what I see with both Jonah and her is that the grace that God has put in your lives for leadership, for service, everything that you're being equipped to do is going to come first into them. Like, they are your first disciples. And Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that this child would know you at a young age, that she would grow up in the peace of God and the example that her parents will live out for her, and that there would never be a day where she doesn't know the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for the legacy that is being produced in this family. And that you have great gifting for this child, that you have a great call on this child's life. And Lord, we stand with them that we will be by their side and do everything in our ability through your grace, Lord, to love this child into the kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord. All right. Just one last prayer here. So as I'm praying for this child, there's just things I realize about her, and I feel, I feel like I understand. I just want to pray them over her. There is going to be a, what I would just call a creative curiosity in this little girl that at times is really going to push you. Like when she's a little girl, you walk into a room and say, what have you done in here? <laughs> and she will have changed everything and pulled it all out and, and redesigned it or You'll say we're going to church, and she'll come out wearing the most interesting clothing choices. <laughs> and it's a creative, like she's curious. It's not her not listening to you. But there's going to be moments where her curiosity is going to be so intense that she's going to explore things even beyond what you're thinking. Mm-hmm. And this is going to be a mark on her life where this curiosity is going to be a gift that God gives her to use her through life. And it's always through the door of creativity, trying new things, exploring new things. There's going to be a hunger to learn about creative process, creative work. There's more than an artist in here. There's like a designer and a thinker and a producer. 
There's somebody in her that can design and pull things together and pull people in her future into a creative process. Even in her teenage years, the creative curiosity. You might even want to write that like on a banner or something and put it in her room. Creative curiosity. Father, we dedicate this little girl to the kingdom of God and to the things of God. Lord, she is going to be very fun to live life with and at times very challenging. I, I believe, Lord, for her that at a young age, she will have faith for great things. Lord, let the, the creative soul that's in her fly in her future. God, we thank you for the great and brilliant intelligence that will be in her, that will be able to think through things quickly. Lord, she is going to serve you with great fire, and she will excel, Lord, in her life. God, we dedicate her now to the kingdom of God, to the moment where she will bow before you and know you and meet you. We dedicate this family to be able to raise a child like this. We thank you for the special relationship her brother and her will have, as he will be a shepherd figure in her life, and they will have such a bond as we just saw right here. Lord, we dedicate them now to eternal things and to your glory and the name of Jesus. Everyone said, Amen. 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 Praise God. All right, we thank God for this today. If you were here today and wondering what in the world all that was about, if you've never seen something like that before, never been to a baby dedication like that, We believe so much in this that we're giving our lives for it. It's a huge value in this church. We believe it's a huge value in the word of God and in the things of God. Sometimes I think we don't realize how much what we're doing now is going to show up at our doorstep in a few years in the lives that are coming after us. May we never be so short-sighted where all we care about is the moment and we consume the moment and don't save anything to give to what's coming. Right? A legacy of faith, a legacy of godliness. As parents, you may not realize it, and all the people who have young children, and even the grandparents, what you're doing and displaying right now in the front of little eyes, both wise and unwise, is teaching them and is setting either permission or boundaries inside of them of what they're gonna do with their own life. Right? There's the adage that says, don't do as I say, uh, do, do as I say. But the truth is reversed. Actually, people do what you do, not what you say. Parenting comes down to just a few things, really. It's protecting your child from what's outside your home that's coming for them to influence them and to capture them for things that you don't want them captured by. And it's also training the impulses inside of them that want those things. And this is why coming to Christ is so important for a child, because the sooner they meet the Lord, the sooner those impulses come under God's governance. And so the things that are coming for them don't have the power to capture them because they've already made a decision for that to not take place. So we need to believe God that our children come to the Lord at a young age and that we do everything we can to bring them there. I cannot make my child be saved. I cannot force that upon them. It's a miracle that God gives, right? But my job is to live life in such a way that I do not violate the presence of God and the power of God and cause my home to be a dark atmosphere where that miracle is difficult to come by. I'm going to say that again. As parents, make sure that you are living a godly life that honors God and the presence of God lives in your home so the miracles can take place rather than inviting dark powers and dark things into our lives, even through secret sin that opens the door to the demonic and evil things that could also come and capture your child. So I may parent and a grandparent. I didn't really plan on talking about this today, but it seems right. 
I remember as a young man, my second child was about four or five years old at the time, Daniel, if you know him. And he marched down the stairs in this house I was living in in a basement at the time. And I was late at night, and I was like organizing things in the basement, trying to put their toys and clothes and stuff away that we'd use later. And you know, when you're a parent, you have, you know, those storage bins where you store children's clothes because the next ones are going to need them. And I was kind of in that process. And my little son walks down the stairs, and I'll never forget the moment because it hit me so hard. He had tears in his eyes, and he was crying. And with trembling voice, he slowly walks down the stairs. And he, imagine, you're like, uh, this bin goes over here. You're in this work detail, and you look up, and it's, you know, like 11 at night, and you're wondering, why is my four-year-old out of bed walking down the stairs, five years old maybe? And he points his little tiny finger at me. And it's almost like the spirit of the Lord spoke through him with trembling voice, his lip trembling with tears running down his face. He says, Dad, he goes, I have been in the presence of God tonight. He said, I have been sitting in the lap of God. And he said, whatever you do, do not do anything that drives that away from our house. I'm like, yeah. I got it, son. Well, how does a, a child think to say that? Whatever you do, not whatever God does or I do. Dad, whatever you do, do not violate God and cause this to leave our home because I need this life. Parents, grandparents, what you live like generates the atmosphere of what your legacy will become. I want all of my children and my grandchildren to be in the presence of God. I want them to be able to hear his voice. As a father, I can tell you a lot of stories like this. But the point is, is like, Lord, I'm not living for myself now. Did you hear Julian talk about that? It's like it all changed. When he came out, we got married, then he came out, it all changed. They're not sleeping and all these things are going on. What happens is when a child is born, your life ends, and their life begins. Can I say that again? You stop living for yourself, and you're now living for them. They are totally and utterly dependent upon you to live, and to the level you take care of them, feed them, nourish them, love them, serve them, determines the quality of what the human being they're going to grow into. Now, God has to come and save us and change what we are all born with that Alejandro alluded to, the original sin. But in the meanwhile, we are trying to see something shaped that glorifies God and lives in God's presence so that the darkness in this world that would love to have them will not. The best way for your children to not be captured by the things that you would be afraid of having them is for you to be full of God serving God and walking with God that protects your home's atmosphere and the culture of your family. You ever been on the airplane when they say when the airplane loses temp uh, air uh, and it drops, put the mask on your own face first, then on your child? You ever seen that moment? In other words, I cannot help my child breathe life. I cannot help them live in the life of God and the presence of God until I'm living in it first. When I came to Jesus, I was a, a first fruits, sort of. My mother came to the Lord a few years before me. But I felt like I was the first male in our family to meet God in such a way that it was going to redirect the course of everyone, in, in, at least in my family. My, even my brothers and sister, like... The power of God was coming to redirect us. As a young man, I've, I've, I felt like a root out of dry ground. It's like we didn't get raised in church. We didn't know the Lord as a kid. I didn't grow up as a boy knowing God. My mom didn't know God yet. My dad didn't know the Lord. We didn't know the Lord. And I felt like I had accumulated a lot of things in life through my childhood and my early teenage years that would be things that would be destructive, that would destroy my life. Someone asked me the other day a question. They said, do you have any friends from high school? And I said, no, they're all dead. 
they're dead. I mean, they're in the grave. There's graves around town. They're gone. Isn't that crazy? I'm not that old for them to all be dead. They're dead. They didn't make it. The things that were going to kill us got them. And it would have had me. But the power of God laid hold of me and grabbed me and said, Son, I have a different plan for you, and it is not death. It's life. It's not death. It's life. And I felt the hand of God come upon me. And I want to reference the verse I quoted earlier in 2 Peter chapter 1. I won't go much longer because we're going to get to the baptisms. All right, we're getting there. 2 Peter chapter 1. So he says here, in verse 1, that Simon Peter is a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he, he says, I'm writing this letter to people who've done this. He says, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I just want to stop right there. To the faith that's the same like we have. I want to say this to you. You cannot live life with people who have a faith different than yours. The Bible says in the book of Amos, how can two walk together lest they agree. I had to marry a woman who had the same kind of faith that I had. If you are a young woman and you're planning on getting married, you need to marry a man who has the same kind of faith you have. What is that faith? Well, it says here, the same kind means that I elevate to importance the same things that you do. Right? I remember when I met my wife, the poor girl, she was only 18 and I was 20. She wasn't my wife yet. It was our first lunch. And I was such an ob obnoxious little guy. I, I, I set my Bible on the table. I said, before anything goes any further, I need to know what you believe about this book. I thought we we're having lunch. We are. <laughs> and I need, because I thought she was wonderful. And she was and is 40 years later. But I said, as wonderful as you are, and oof, you are wonderful, by the way. Oh, my God. But before we go too crazy here, <laughs> before we get ahead of ourselves, like, you know, me going to ask your dad if I can marry you, before we, we get way out here, because I was not at, the, at that point in my life, I was not like just pursuing women for entertainment. I was looking for God's eternal purposes. I said, what do you believe about this book? Because I really think something's going on here, but I could be confused. So and she's like, wow. You know, you don't come ready to answer that question. Like, well, I've been waiting for that question all day, and I'm going to tell you my systematic theology and my biblical theology. And I'm going to tell you what I believe about 66 books written over 1,200 years. She hadn't thought all that through yet at 18. <laughs> she was just glad she knew Jesus, as I was. But I had been reading this book, and I'm thinking, there's a lot of people that go to church in this country, and just because we all go to church doesn't mean we all believe the same thing. Right? right? right. And I needed to understand something, and I, more importantly, I also wanted her to understand something about me. It's like, I am serious here, and I am intent. Am I perfect? Far from it. In fact, I've only been a Christian a year one thing I know, I am not going back to the things that had me or captured me. I'm going forward, and whatever comes next is going to be full of the... You can give God praise. You get it. I have been captured by God, and the Spirit of the Lord grabbed me and said, you are going to become somebody else. My mom got saved before me and interceded me into the kingdom, and when God laid hold of me, I understood that he had chosen me. And so it says down here, in verse 10 of that chapter, chapter 1 of 2 Peter, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Now, I want to know that God chose me. In fact, I would just say this to you. If you've ever had this type of process in your history where you knew that you should serve God and that you should follow God. 
but you've not made that decision to fully surrender because you don't feel like you can give up the appetites of sin. Or the devil has lied to you and said, you can never really change, no matter how hard you try. I don't know if you ever did this, but before I actually really served God in reality, I said the sinner's prayer, what we call this prayer of dedication, many times. Did anyone ever do that besides me? Say a prayer of, I, I repent and I ask you to forgive me, come and live, be my Lord and Savior, and forgive me my sins, live in my heart, amen. And who, who did that before you actually really walked with God? Raise your hand. Yeah, I, I did that. And I was like, why does this never take? Did you ever wonder that too? I mean, for like the first three days after that moment, yes, Lord, I'm going to serve you. And three days later, it's like, mm -hmm, not really. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to like, you know, you know, like deny you in front of men, but I'm not really going to do this. And it's like I just moved back to my old life. And the thing I was wrestling with all that time, and you might have done this, the thing I was wrestling with wasn't so much of what I was going to do, but the fact that he wouldn't let me go. There was always this awareness, always an awareness. It's like, even when I was out doing terrible things, I would feel the hand of God going, whoa, back off. Did you ever have those moments? You'd be doing terrible things, and even God was there going, whoa, back it up. Am I the, did anyone ever, ha that happened to you? You're like, you're in darkness, and this could go really bad. And the Lord's like, too far, move back. You'll never get outside of this again if you, don't, if you make the decisions you're about to. And I would bump into these moments where it's like, you're here and you are messing with me. You're, you're, somehow I said that prayer and, and I haven't been living in this thing, but you have grabbed me and pulled me out of moments. Somehow you are still here. You're still here? I'd be shocked. Like, you're still here. I mean, we're out like drinking and smoking weed and doing terrible things, and then more terrible things would present themselves. How many of you know when you're doing terrible things, more terrible things get presented? Is that true? Right? The devil's like, I have more for you, and he just keeps feeding you off his plate. Well, I'll have some of that, and I'll have some of that. And then the Lord steps in and says, you will not have that. This other nonsense has been terrible, but this will kill you. And I could feel God pulling me back me think man you just sound crazy Tom no I was a sinner on his way to hell and God was reaching into my life and trying to pull me into his kingdom and I was wrestling with it and the thing that I could never let go of is that he had called me to something that he had his hand on me and I just couldn't reconcile it but I knew it did anyone live in that even though you weren't really serving God there were boundaries you wouldn't cross because you knew deep down inside he had chosen you, he had come to you, and you couldn't deny that reality. You couldn't harden your heart that far. And you're stuck in this middle ground. Nick, Nick understands it. <laughs> Does anybody else understand what I'm, I'm talking about the way this lives? And I remember one night, August 21st of 1982, I was on my way to a party. That's how far back this goes. I can honestly say I've been young and I've been old. <laughs> and I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed beg for bread. I can actually say that verse now. And so when I was young, I could just say I've been young. But now I can say I'm young and old. And so for those of you who can say that, praise the Lord. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. So I was on my way to this party and the voice of God spoke to me. Greg, he spoke to me and he said, it's over. I said, what's over? He goes, your life. He said, from this night onward, you are going to answer your call. He didn't say, you're going to be a better Christian. You're going to go to church now. You're going to read the Bible for 10 minutes every day. You're going to use profanity less. You're going to put the weed down. He didn't say any of that. He said, from this night on, you are going to answer your call. And I was blown out of the water. It's like something went off inside. A switch was thrown. And all of a sudden, a miracle took place, and I became somebody else. Whatever I had been up to that moment, I was no longer that person. A miracle had happened, and I was arrested. And I knew that because he had chosen me for something and called me to do something, 
I was going to have to have a life that fulfilled that. And that meant not going to the party I was on my way to to do the terrible things I was going to do. It meant going home and going to bed and getting ready for church. August 22nd, 1982, I went to the church. I got on my knees and I said, it's it. It's over. We're done. I got on my knees and I prayed. I gave my life to him. And I said, from this day onward, I will belong to you completely and totally. It was actually in the evening and I went to the service at night. Interestingly, the girl I had lunch with and I asked her what she would leave about the Bible. I went to her house to meet her parents and she showed me a poem that she had written the night she gave her life to Jesus in Bakersfield. And on the date was August 22nd, 1982. In two different cities, people that didn't know each other bowed their heart to Jesus in the same night. I said, this is the night you got saved, like you really surrendered. She goes, yeah, I wrote a poem to commemorate it. I was kind of like, whoa. And that began a transition. And what I wrestled with from that day onward was not whether I was going to quit smoking weed, drinking alcohol, using profanity, and doing all the other nonsense. I could list a, lot, a whole list of things that are stupid. You know, sin is stupid, right? I should have got an amen right there. Sin is dumb. I look back on it now, and I think, I was just stupid. Gilbert, my, my dad, he used to say, sin just makes people dumb. There's a spirit of dumb involved in sinning. Remember that, Gilbert? Sin is as dumb, makes you dumb. You ever meet really dumb people? Sin, you might, you might be amazed how intelligent you become if you give your life to Jesus. How smart you become. When I was my first year in college, I was a D plus C minus student. You know why? Because I was out all night doing that whole list of stuff I don't want to talk about, but it was bad. And going to school was not a priority. Being dumb was. And doing dumb stuff. Gosh, we need to wrap this up here, but. Being dumb. <laughs> and when I got saved, the Lord said, you're too dumb to go to school. It's like, just shut it down. You don't know what you're doing. Like, just quit college and read the Bible for a while, and you're going to get a little smarter. And so when I went back to school, a few years later, the Lord told me to go back to school, totally different school, totally different purpose, to get a theological degree instead of a dope smoker's degree. All of a sudden, I was a 4.0 student on the dean's list. And I thought, I didn't know I could do that. I was expecting to be a D plus C minus student, and lo and behold, I was straight A's. What had happened? Salvation. <laughs> and the spirit of dumb, I had been delivered of dumb. And I had been given something else called the spirit of God, of life in Christ Jesus, setting me free from dumb. Right? Man, when I saw that first report card of straight A's, I said, man, Lord, you have called me. Because I've been dumb my whole life. There's no way I could have done that. That was you, Lord. I gave him the glory. What am I saying today? Salvation transforms you and delivers you from the things that would kill you. So that that dumb life of death and destruction... That would kill you. Can I tell you, dumb kills people. I had this best friend all through high school. We were best pals for four years. We were together every day, it seemed like. At 27 years old, he died in the walk-in freezer at a restaurant bar freebasing cocaine. Dumb. I was like, my God, that could have been me. That could have been my life. I'm not trying to speak ill of his death, but I'm saying that was really foolish. Freebasing cocaine's dangerous. What was he thinking? He died of a heart attack. 
And I thought, Lord, deliver me from every power that would kill me and destroy me. And now back to the legacy comments. Deliver me, Lord, from everything that would destroy my children that's living in me that will get birthed in them if it doesn't get out of me. When I met that girl and we had that dialogue about what do you believe about this book and we realized we got saved on the same night and all that, I was saying, Lord, whoever I marry, let me become a man of God who serves God so that her children do not replay the horror story of our lives. And may she be the kind of woman who lives for you so that the mistakes we made as young people, we don't keep making all through our marriage until it lives and gets legs in the next generation. And they become so confused, not by our words, but by our witness of what we did that they saw us living like that it got into them. I do not want to feed into my next generation the stuff that's in unresolved, unresolved in my heart. I have to have a lifestyle of godliness and consecration that prepares me to be a father. I'd rather be a great dad that, puts a, that presents a life of righteousness in front of my children that they can live like more than make a million dollars. Right? Have you been a perfect dad? No, of course not. We are, we are always trying. But at least we're leaning the right way. If you have come to the Lord in recent days and have surrendered your life to God and God has chosen you, even if your children are in your house and they're not babies and they've watched your life before, your life now has the power to change them even today. The Spirit of God in your life, in your faith in God has enough power, even if your children are adults and you step into the things of God, that transformation has enough power. It's like a magnetic pulse that begins to pull them to the things of God. Every time one of us puts our faith in God and surrenders to Jesus Christ and makes him truly Lord, it changes things in the world. Let's just get it started earlier than later. (laughs) Praise God. Have hope for your children. Have hope for your legacy. Have hope for your future, the lives that are coming after you. The decisions I make for God now change and affect all of that. And the ones I don't make do the same. (laughs) The people that came to be baptized today, who are all the people that are being baptized, by the way? There's two of us. Is there any more today? Let's just go ahead and make our way over here. All those that are being baptized. Can we thank God for them as they're coming? (laughs) Praise God. This moment of baptism is a moment of transformation. This is the point in your life when you go into the water. It is your public confession and statement before God and man to say, all of that life that would have destroyed me, that was uncertain about God choosing me and calling me, and all the things that lived, all the legs it had, all the things it was going to do in my life, all the future sin had uh, taken advantage of and tried to direct and create future catastrophe, future loss, all of that is going into the water and it's being put to death. And I recognize that Jesus died on the cross for all of my sin and that his blood washed me and forgave me for all of the wickedness I had done in my life and that when I surrender to Jesus and I repent and I ask God to forgive me and I ask him to come and live in my heart and be my God and I turn over control to him and I begin to be what he chose me to be, I so deeply identify with that that his death becomes my death. The death he died to sin, I died to sin. And the life he rose to have 
full of glory and eternal life. I rise out of the waters to live for the glory of God and, ha and to have eternal life living in me. This is called the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, that God came to forgive sinners and to save them and to deliver them from the power of hell that would both take them into eternal darkness and destroy their life and kill them at an early age. I believe there are people in this room right now that the power of God and the spirit of God is dealing with you. And just like he did with me where I knew he had called me, but I could not surrender fully. The miracle was moving over me, but it hadn't happened enough yet for me to become someone else. Can I say something to you? Today may be your day. Today may be your day to say, God, I surrender and I'm asking for the miracle of salvation to enter my soul and to transform me so that this becomes real enough for my children to have a life full of the glory of God. So these that are being baptized today, I'd like uh, Jason and Nick to come up here with me. I'm so excited. Darren, your girls are being baptized. Look at the joy in them. We'll just be here for a few more minutes and we're going to go. But as you watch these be baptized, can we rejoice with them that God's doing something great? And may we ask God to do something in our hearts. If you've not surrendered to Jesus yet, today's the day. And so who do we have being baptized today? Is Evelyn looks pretty excited. Do you want, which sister's going first? Okay. Who's going first? Okay, all right. All right. All right, Jason. Hi. I'm going to ask a couple of questions, okay? This is Imogen, by the way. That's her father, Darren. We are super excited. You gave your heart to Jesus just a couple of weeks ago. So have you surrendered your life fully to Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? Yeah. Will you, as best you can, follow him and keep him as your Lord for the rest of your life? That's your confession of faith. What I'd like you to do now, um, do you want to wear, the, take the shoes off maybe? Dad's going to help. Imogen, on the confession of your faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I just say it has been a privilege watching this family come into this church they are real disciples and it I can I can say having walked with them for over a year that the testimony of how they have surrendered their lives to God has now made a place for these girls to meet the Lord so parents it's legacy hi Evelyn have you surrendered your life completely to Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. Yes. Will you follow him the rest of your life, every day, as best as you're able, and keep him as your Lord? Yes. Praise God. Come on in. <laughs> okay. Well, Evelyn... 
on the confession of your faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hey, buddy. You ready for this? I believe you, you gave your heart to Jesus when we had the baptisms two weeks ago. So exciting. I'm going to get down here. Okay, Christian. The fitting name. You're going to live your life that way. Have you given your life completely to Jesus? You surrender your life. Say, you are my Lord and you are my Savior. Yes. Will you keep him as your Lord and Savior and follow him? Let him lead you for the rest of your life. Yes. It's a good answer. We're excited. Come on in, bud. Almost immersed already. <laughs> All right, buddy. Can you see me? On the confession of your faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. these girls right towards this moment I think you need to get involved in this I just want to say something to the rest of us real quick about this little boy that just was baptized Christian you say but he's a little boy what does he really understand and, and why does this matter I just want to I want to answer that question faith doesn't know an age the understanding of what God has done for us, we grow into that as we, as we grow in Christ and we grow older. But faith is real at any age. Is when he's able to understand and comprehend that God has chosen him, he has to have the opportunity to choose him and to respond to him. And people have often asked me, Tom, how is it that you're a minister and a pastor and all five of your children serve God and so do their spouses and all of your grandchildren? How did you pull that off? Well, God did it. But the thing is, is I recognized the moments. My friends recognized the moments with their children when God was doing something, and they responded to the faith they had. And that faith is the roadblock to get them in, uh, the roadway, not a roadblock, a roadway, a path forward to get them into their life. We thank God that these children, these, these little girls that came up here and this boy, this is the path they are living on, and this sets something in their foundation they won't forget. God has chosen them, and they know it. And the sooner we know that, the better. How many of you can say amen to that? The sooner we know God chose us, the better. Amen? All right. Praise God. Let's bring out a Genesis. And I'll invite... Stephanie has been working with her, and she's going to help with the baptizing today. Genesis, it's been a privilege having you in this church. You're serving already quite well. Have you surrendered your life completely to Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? Yes, entirely. And will you follow him for the rest of your life? Keep him as your Lord to the best of your ability. All day for the rest of my life. Praise God. Come on in. Okay. Genesis. On the confession of your faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Yes. I just want to say something over you, Genesis. The, as you were going into the water, the, the Lord made it so clear to me, there is something changing in your life right now. 
like today, right now, where you are being captured for the purposes of God, like I was talking about in this message, get ready for all kinds of things to start happening. God is coming, and the things you've asked him about, about what you're going to do next and where you're going to go and who you're going to be and who you're going to do that with are all getting ready to be resolved. There is, an, there is a speeding up coming to you where the Lord is going to begin to move powerfully upon your life like a whirlwind, and you're going to know it's him. Thank God for these relationships to interpret it, but get ready. This right here just set a bunch of things in motion. Um, do, you, do you want that? Praise God. Stretch your hands towards her. Lord, there's more than a, just a baptism going on, and that's awesome, but you're capturing her for a holy calling. And Lord, you're like a net capturing her and bringing her into eternal things, and such adjustment has come into her life. Lord, that she is going to have great purpose even in this church. Lord, we thank you for her life. We dedicate her right here. We dedicate you, Genesis, to holy things and holy purpose. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. This is Alani. Stephanie, you've also been working with her. I don't know Alani very well. I've only met her a few times, but I just want to say this is one of the sweetest young women I have met in so long. She has such a tender heart before the Lord. It's so obvious when you talk to her that there's something real going on in here that is not by man's doing. It's not by the, a work of flesh, not by just good ideas, but there's something really precious uh, living in her heart, the change that Jesus has brought to her life. And um, I'm excited to get to know her more. And I'm just, I, she wasn't expecting me to say this. I didn't expect to say this, but I just feel like as we're getting to know Alani, I'm, I'm first to say, Alani's lovely, and I can't wait for us to get to know her better to see what she's going to do in Jesus. Alani, today you're going to make a public confession of your faith in Jesus. Have you surrendered your life fully and completely to Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I, in fact, have. Praise God. <laughs> And will you continue to follow him as Lord and Savior for the rest of your life? Yes, I will. All right. Come on in. Alani, on the confession of your faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. Amen. Right, we have one more here. This is Cheyenne. Cheyenne, it's the same questions I've asked to everybody else. Have you surrendered your life fully to Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior? Yes. And will you follow him for the rest of your life as Lord and Savior to the best of your ability? Yes. Okay. Come on in. Cheyenne, on the confession of your faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.